Good afternoon, everyone. Today's webinar is on intestinal nematodes. And we are going to be focusing on the morphological aspects of common intestinal nematodes. Even with the advent of molecular methods and their increasing usage in the diagnosis of parasites, morphological identification still remains the gold standard in diagnostic parasitology. Unfortunately, there has been a steady decline over the years in well-trained staff in this area. So hopefully today's webinar will be helpful to somebody in this area. These are the general, some of the general features of nematodes. Nematodes are roundworms. They are unsegmented and have bilateral symmetry. They range in size from a few millimeters in length to over a meter. The intestinal nematodes that we shall cover today are diagnosed usually by finding their characteristic eggs and occasionally the adult worm in feces. Usually the sexes are separate. An exception to finding the eggs in uh, feces is with the strongyloides, where the eggs hatch in the intestine and only the larva is recovered in stool. The case of pinworm also deserves some mention here in that eggs are rarely passed or recovered in stool. A special technique, the scotch tape, is required for the diagnosis of pinworms. An infection with nematodes is acquired either by ingesting eggs or by level penetration through the skin. The eggs are identified by their size, their shape, thickness, or color. The phylum of nematodes is the second largest phylum in the animal kingdom. It includes up to 500,000 species. Fortunately, most of these are either free living in nature or they are animal parasites that do not infect humans. The list in this slide represents the common intestinal nematodes of humans. And these shall be our focus today. First on the list is Enterobius vermicularis, commonly known as pin worm. It is the most common helminthic infection in the US. About 40 million persons are infected in the US and Canada. Nevertheless, it has a worldwide distribution occurring primarily in children. Humans are the only known hosts. Adult pinworms can reside in the different portions of the large intestine. Female worms are 8 to 13 millimeters long. The males are much smaller, measuring only 2 to 5 millimeters. In addition to their small size, the males can be differentiated by their blunt posterior, from which a single spicule can be pushed out and retracted. 
The females, on the other hand, have pointed tails, a feature from which the pimwons derive their name. Both sexes have a thin membranous flare known as cephalic expansion in their anterior. The image on your left, this one, is that of a male worm with retracted speckle. In the center is a female worm with pointed tail. And the image on the right is that of a, uh, uh, either a male or a female. But here it shows the cephalic expansion that I mentioned at the end. It's a characteristic of pin worms. The slide here shows the life cycle of Enterobius vermicularis. This and many of the images in this presentation can be found in the DPDX website. Pin worms are obligate parasites and humans are the only known natural hosts. Infection is by fecal oral contamination. After ingestion, the eggs hatch in the small intestine within six hours. It takes about two weeks for the worms to mature, and they usually have a lifespan of about two months. Most pinworm infections are without symptoms, although there may be itching in the anal region, especially at night, as a result of female worms crawling out of the anus to lay their eggs in the perianal folds. In the image on the left, one can identify lots of pin worms in the uh, anal region. These are probably female worms that have crawled out to lay their eggs. On the right is an image of a gentleman digging in to satisfy the kind of itch produced by pinworms. But one has to be careful because prolonged scratching as a result of pinworm itch may lead to excoriation and bacterial superinfection. There may also be occasional invasion of the female urogenital tract. Other symptoms that may be seen with pinworm infection include anorexia, irritability, abdominal pain. Pinworm is easily treated and it has a cure rate of about 90%, 90 to 95% with treatment. Pinworm eggs are elongate. Their size measurement is 50 to 60 micrometers long and 20 to 30 micrometers wide. Typically, they are flattened on one end, on one side. When shared in the perianal folds, they are partially embryonated, but they are not easily recovered in stool samples. The best way to diagnose pinworm is by cellulose tape preparations. Under UV microscopy, pinworms can fluoresce, as shown in the image here, with a bright blue fluorescence. We next move to Ascaris lumbricoides. Ascariasis is the most common helminthic infection worldwide. It is most common in wet climates. Adult worms reside in the small intestine of their host. And infection with Ascaris is acquired by ingesting fertilized eggs. Ascaris lumbricoides is the largest nematode infecting the human intestinal tract. 
the males have a curved tail and measure between 15 and 31 centimeters long, while the females are a little bigger and have straight tails and measure 20 to 35 centimeters long. Both sexes have well, three well-developed lips, as shown in the image here. Infection with Ascaris is by ingestion of fertilized eggs. The eggs hatch in the small intestine. They make their way into the general circulation and carried to the lungs. Further development occur in the lungs. They then penetrate the alveolar walls ascend the trachea or the bronchial tree into the throat and then are swallowed. Back in the small intestine, they reside and mature into adult ones. Infections with Ascaris is usually asymptomatic, although growth could be stunted. The worms in this image were passed by a single individual. Looks very much like a bowl of spaghetti, doesn't it? But you will do well to stay away from this one. In heavy infections such as this, there may be abdominal pain and intestinal obstruction. Migrating adult wounds may also cause symptomatic blockage of the biliary tract. Furthermore, the migration of Ascaris larva through the lungs may produce pulmonary symptoms such as cough, dyspnea, hemoptysis, and eosinophilic pneumonia or Loeffler syndrome. Diagnosis of Ascaris is usually made by finding fertilized eggs and um, uh, both fertilized and unfertilized eggs in feces. It may also be diagnosed by finding the larvae in sputum or by finding adult worms that are occasionally passed in feces. When passed, the eggs are in the one cell stage. A larva develops within the eggs in about 10 days after passage. Inside the thick shell of the eggs, the larva can resist treatment with 10% formalin for several years. Now this is indeed remarkable and something to bear in mind when handling formalin preserved stool samples. This slide shows different presentations of Ascaris eggs. All the eggs in this slide are fertilized. As you can see, they, are, they can be round or oval. This one more oval and this one more round. They are yellowish brown in color and they may be corticated or decorticated when shed. The ones here at the bottom here are corticated uh, egg, eggs, whereas the ones, the two on the right hand side have lost the cortical layer. They range in size from 55 to 75 micrometers by 35 to 50 micrometers. There is a clear difference between the fertilized and unfertilized egg. Unfertilized eggs are usually elongate, measuring 85 to 95 micrometers by 
40 to 50 micrometers. The shell is thinner and the corticated layer is irregular to smooth. The internal contents are disorganized. It is important to note that unfertilized eggs of Ascaris cannot be recovered by the zinc sulfate flotation method of concentration. In examination of stool wet mounts, you have to watch out for pollen grains, which can be mistaken for Ascaris eggs. But these can be differentiated from Ascaris by their variations in size, as well as by their spine-like covering the shell, as seen here. These spine-like projections, you don't see that with Ascaris. They may appear to the untrained eye as the corticated layer that you see with Ascaris X. Next, we move to the hookworms. Hookworms are the second most common helminthic infections in humans. They are distributed worldwide. The human hookworms include the four species that are shown here, Nicato americanus, Ancylostoma duodenale, Ancylostoma selanicum, and Ancylostoma caninum. Hookworms derive their name from the slightly bent head, um, the head region of Nicato americanus. The species of hookworms covered here today can be differentiated by their mouth parts. Nicato americanus have a chitinous semilunar cotton plates. It is the only species that have the cotton plates rather than the teeth. These are the cotton plates here. The rest of them have teeth in their mouth parts. However, they can be differentiated uh, even in their uh, in the number of teeth and how the teeth are arranged in the mouth parts. Ankylostoma duodenale and Ankylostoma selanicum each have two pair of teeth ventrally. The difference between them is that with Ankylostoma selanicum, this one here, one pair of teeth is bigger and outer, while the second pair of teeth is much smaller and a bit recessed inside in the interior. Whereas with Ankylostoma duodenale, they are both, the two pairs of teeth are seem to be of the same size and in the same uh, formation. Ankylostoma caninum, on the other hand, has three pair of teeth. It's very hard to discern or to see them clearly with these images. But if you look here, this is one, two, three, and on the other side, one, two, three, the three pair of teeth in Ankylostoma caninum. Hookworm eggs are morphologically indistinguishable, but with PCR, they can be differentiated. Three species of hookworms, Ankylostoma duodenale, Nicato americanus, sorry for the misspelling here, it's supposed to be an S here, Ankylostoma selanicum, all can cause hookworm infection in humans. A larger group of zoonotic hookworms, including the three named here, Ankylostoma caninum, Ankylostoma brasiliensis, and Eucinaria stenocephala can penetrate human skin but do not develop any further. They cause cutaneous lava migrants, also known as creeping er eruptions. As these worms wander about, 
they leave a serpiginous tract all over. These tracts are very, very itchy. The image here in, in this slide shows uh, the creeping eruptions that can develop from the wandering uh, larvae. Occasionally, ankylostoma caninum can migrate to human intestinal, to human intestine, causing eosinophilic enteritis. Hookworm life cycle. Eggs are passed in pieces. They hatch into the first larval stage in one to two days. These are not infectious. The rabbitiform larvae are, as they are called, molt twice to develop into infective filariform larvae in five to 10 days. The infective larvae can survive up to four weeks in favorable environment. Infective larvae penetrate the skin on contact, then are carried through the blood vessels to the heart and then to the lungs. They then penetrate alveolar walls and ascend the bronchial tree to the throat and swallowed. This is kind of very similar to what we saw with Ascaris. In the small intestine, they mature and reside. Most adult worms die within one to two years. Iron deficiency is the most common symptom. It is caused by blood loss at the site of intestinal attachment of the adult worms. Gastrointestinal symptoms can also occur. These include abdominal pain, diarrhea, and nausea. Fatigue as well as respiratory symptoms can be observed during the migration of the larvae. In addition, local manifestations and ground itch can occur during the penetration of the filarial larva. Here we see more images of the creeping eruptions that we mentioned earlier. Remember, these are very, very itchy and uncomfortable. Diagnosis of hookworms depend on recovering the eggs from stool. The eggs are colorless and have thin shells. They measure 60 to 70 micrometers by 35 to 40 micrometers. The eggs are in the morula stage when passed and within 24 to 36 hours will develop into a larvae. The first larval stage of hookworms can be found in stool. They resemble strongyloides larvae from which they need to be differentiated. Differentiation is not difficult. Hookworm larvae have a longer buccal canal and a less prominent genital primordium. Mite eggs are similar to hookworm eggs and may be confused with it. Mite eggs are, however, much bigger, but not always. So we have to watch out for these artifacts that may sometimes look like nematode eggs. We move on to Trichuris trichuria. This is the third most common nematode in humans. It is commonly known as whipworm in reference to its shape and resemblance to a whip. Adult females measure 35 to 50 millimeters and the males 30 to 45 millimeters. The whip-like anterior burrows into the intestinal mucosa while the larger posterior hangs freely in the intestinal lumen. The image shows the posterior end of an adult whipworm 
taken during colonoscopy. The adults reside in the large intestine, cecum, and appendix of the host. Diagnosis is made by detecting eggs in stool. Life cycle. Infection is by ingesting ingestion of egg. Eggs are embryonated when passed in stool. In the soil, they embryonate and become infective within 15 to 30 days. When ingested, the eggs hatch in the small intestine. The released larva mature and establish themselves in the adult uh, and, uh, and develop into adults in the colon. Most individuals with whipworm infections are asymptomatic. In patients with heavy infection, dysentery can, dysentery can result. Uh, uh, dysentery can occur, resulting in symptoms of anemia and iron deficiency. Heavy infections tend to occur in small children. There may also be gastrointestinal problems such as abdominal pain, rectal pleurus, and growth retardation. The eggs of Trichiris trichira are elongate and barrel shaped. They measure 50 to 55 micrometers by 20 to 25 micrometers. Like the Ascaris eggs, they are yellowish brown in color and have thick shell. A clear polar plug is attached at each end of the barrel. When passed, the eggs are unembryonated and often you can find Trichuris trichura in co-infection with Ascaris. Diatoms may often be confused with whipworm eggs that have lost their polar plugs. Again, you have to look at the size, the thickness of the shell, the internal structures, and even the color of uh, the objects to be able to distinguish them from uh, whipworm eggs. Now we come to Strongyloides tacorelis. There are two species of Strongyloides that infect humans. Strongyloides tacorelis and Strongyloides filaboni, which is primarily parasite of chimpanzees and baboons. The better known of the two species of strongyloides is the strongyloides tacorelis, which has a worldwide distribution. Strongyloides filaboni is found primarily in Africa and Papua New Guinea. Strongyloides have a free living and a parasitic life cycle. There are no males. The females reproduce parthenogenetically. Auto-infection is possible in immunocompromised individuals. The eggs of strongyloides usually hatch in the small, in the small in the intestine uh, prior to excretion, and as such, they are not normally seen in stool samples. In my more than 40 years in the clinical lab, I have never seen a strongyloides egg. So diagnosis is made by identifying the larvae in feces. If stool processing is delayed, 
The L1 lever that is passed in stool may develop into the filariform lever. These can be distinguished from hookworm lever by their notched tail. As seen here, as opposed to hookworm tail, which is uh, extended and long. Here again, this shows, we're going to move faster because I see we're running short of time. It is a life cycle of strangulator is showing the free living cycle as well as the parasitic you know, cycle. Infection is by ingestion of the filary form uh, larvae, which will then produce mature into the adults and lay the eggs which hatch uh, to produce the uh, L1 larvae, the rabbit son larvae and the cycle continues on and on. It's important to know that the free living cycle do not continue indefinitely. I think they only last uh, for two cycles and then they die. So it's not an indefinite cycle. They need the parasitic cycle to continue. Strongy larvae measure 180 to 380 micrometers long by 14 to 20 micrometers wide. They possess a short buccal canal and a prominent genital primordium. Remember that in the case of hookworm, the buccal canal is long and the genital primordium is less prominent. Plant hairs and fibers are often seen in stool preparations and can be confused with hookworm or strongy larvae but they can easily be distinguished by the lack of strictures seen in helminth larvae. They also have a refractile uh, center as well as a very blunt end. The filariform larvae may be seen if stool processing is delayed. They are much longer than the rhabditiform larva that hatch from the eggs. They measure up to 600 micrometers in length and 16 micrometers wide. And as we mentioned before, they have a, a notched tail by which they can be distinguished from hookworm larvae. Another important factor is the ratio of the esophagus to the intestine in the filariform level is about uh, a one-to-one -one ratio. Now we move on to the Capillaria philippinensis. Fish-eating birds are the natural definitive hosts. As the name suggests, Capillaria philippinensis is endemic in the Philippines and occurs also in Thailand but their distribution stretches to the Middle East, Egypt, Japan, and the Southeast Asia. Adults reside in the small intestine of hosts. They are very small worms, measuring only 2.5 to 4.3 millimeters for the females and 2.3 to 3.2 millimeters for the males. Diagnosis is made by demonstration of eggs in feces. Unfortunately, I do not have um, a slide of capillaria eggs, but they look very much like uh, trichiris eggs, except they are broader and have striations and may have very inconspicuous plugs at the very at the end. But for those who are inexperienced, they might at first look appear to be whipworm eggs. The life cycle is rather simple because this is, like we mentioned before, a parasite of um, uh, birds. When eggs are passed, they are not embryonated. They become embryonated in, and 
when consumed by freshwater uh, fish, uh, when the eggs are eaten by freshwater fish, they mature, uh, the, the larvae hatch and penetrate the intestine and migrate into the tissues. This is their normal natural life cycle. Humans are accidentally uh, infected by eating fish that have infective larvae in their tissue that are undercooked or uh, uncooked or partially cooked. Symptoms include abdominal pain and diarrhea. Infection with capillaria may be severe if untreated due to possible auto-infection. It also has a potential to be fatal. We just have a few a couple of more slides. Trichostrangylus species. These are primarily parasites of animals. However, several species have been known to infect uh, man, including Trichostrangylus orientalis, Trichostrangylus uh, colub colubriformis, and Trichostrangylus axae. The life cycle also is simple. The eggs are passed in feces. They hatch into the rabbitiform larvae, which then develop into the infective filariform larvae. When ingested, the larvae mature into adults and reside in the small intestine. Trichostrangulus eggs have a striking resemblance to hookworm eggs, but they are much larger than hookworm eggs, ranging in size from 75 to 95 micrometers by 40 to 50 micrometers. Furthermore, the eggs are tapered at one end. Mushroom spores may be confused with hookworm or trichostrangulus eggs. Here again, size and internal structures are important in distinguishing between them. And as I've mentioned earlier, nematodes like to uh, travel together, you often find co-infections with more than one uh, nematode in, uh, in an individual. So that is something to keep in mind when you are making stool examinations. And finally, you can get more information on the life cycles and uh, other things that have been talked in this uh, presentation from our website at cdc.gov slash dpdx slash az dot html. Also, you may email us with additional questions at dpdx at cdc.gov. I would like to seize this opportunity to mention the teledex or telediagnosis feature that we have available uh, here. It requires for you to have an internet and a microscope that is uh, equipped with a camera. When you come across any image, uh, parasite, or suspected parasite that you would like help in identifying, you can email us at dpdx uh, at cdc.gov to request for assistance. We will then send you a link for downloading the submission form as well as a link for uploading your completed submission form and images. The service is 
absolutely free and at no cost to you. And it's also very, very uh, fast. We encourage you to send images you know, to us that you have uh, need help or have difficulty you know, identifying. And then finally, I would like to also inform all of you that there will be a workshop on bloodborne tissue and intestinal parasites later on this year here at CDC between September 24th and the 28th. I know that the flyers will soon be out probably by next month, so watch out for that. And with that, I bring this webinar to a conclusion. I'm sorry we might have run over a little, uh, but I thank you and will be ready to answer you know, some of your questions. So we would like to thank our speaker, Dr. McKevin Ndubisi, for presenting today on diagnostic features of intestinal nematodes. Uh, as he mentioned, we will now respond to questions sent in by you, our participants. If you have any questions for our speaker, please type them now into the chat area. Dr. Ndubisi, uh, I'll facilitate by reading you the attendees' questions one by one so that you can respond. So one of the questions that was posed while you were presenting was, what are five sure ways of identifying Ascaris lumbricoids eggs from debris? Uh, thank you. That's uh, a good question. One of the uh, things that you have to have in making stool examinations, it's very important to have an eyepiece that is fitted with a micrometer that you can use to measure the objects that you see. Because the size of objects are very important in distinguishing uh, parasite eggs from uh, artifacts. Then again, you also have to look at the internal you know, structures. And as I pointed out in the case of pollen grains, the color might be different. And although the spines that surround the shell of the pollen grain might look like the corticated layer of Ascaris eggs. When you zoom in, in, you would see that the spines on the pollens are pointed and sharp and are very different from what you see with Ascaris eggs. So the bottom line is to be able to uh, go by the size of the object, going with the range that has been provided for Ascaris eggs, the color, the internal structures, and you know that's a cortical, uh, corticated layer that you might see. Although, as we saw, sometimes that corticated layer may be lost, but still, from the general feature of the internal structures, you'll be able to identify, you know, the Ascaris eggs. Thank you.